Hey, it's Freddie Cruz, and I've made it my job to share with you the stories of the individuals, businesses, and organizations that make the greater Houston area great. Hey, it's Freddie Cruz. Hey, it's Freddie Cruz, and I've made it my job to share with you the stories of the individuals, businesses, organizations, and places that make the greater Houston area great. One such place is up in North Houston. It's the National Museum of Funeral History. As you may know, I operate a podcast production agency. They are one of my clients. Their show is called The Final Curtain Never Closes, and it's hosted by my friend, president and CEO of the museum, Genevieve Keeney Vasquez. She recently invited me to be a guest on her show for their September 11th anniversary episode, and that's what you're going to hear. During this conversation, Genevieve and I discuss mourning as a nation, the importance of mourning our lost loved ones, and you're going to hear an incredibly harrowing story of a father and son who lost their lives on 9-11-2001. Learn more about the museum at nmfh.org and subscribe to their show, The Final Curtain Never Closes, wherever you get your podcasts. This is a, uh, a month that I know that we all remember, unfortunately, all too well. Uh, the month of September for me is bittersweet. It's my birth month, but at the same time, it's a month that I will never forget historically. Uh, you know, September 11th, is a date that I think is probably the um, most impactful day in so many people's lives. And I speak to that because we have an exhibit here at the National Museum of Funeral History uh, where we honor those who lost their lives uh, in the tragic events of September 11th. And um, we remember that day and all those who were heroes that day to try and help those in need. Uh, So today we're going to talk about a little bit on not only what September 11th means to me, uh, but what September 11th means to us as a nation, to us as Americans, and just human beings in general. And I was going to do this podcast pretty much by myself and talk to you all and and tell you stuff about it that I remember. And um, I began having a little bit of a conversation uh, with my producer here, uh, Freddie Cruz, and I thought to myself, September 11th impacted you as well. It impacted all of us. So I would like to welcome Freddie Cruz, my producer, to join me on this podcast today because he too can reflect on that day. It's 22 years now that it's since it's happened. Doesn't and it seem like yesterday? It seems like yesterday. All the time. Especially when you're a parent, and I know you're a parent also. Yes. And so you subtract those years. Yeah, exactly, right? I yeah. mean, some of us have kids that weren't even born yet, but then some were toddlers, and I'm sure they're now learning it in their history books or have learned it, and yeah, they would be 22 years old now. Yeah, and you think about the the little kids who who lost their parents or their grandparents or aunts, uncles, and they they didn't get a chance to say goodbye, or in, in some cases, they were they're infants. And so they don't, there's no memory at all of these people. Yeah. There's no memory of the person itself, but there will always be a memory of the incident. Right. Yeah. Cause it'll be talked about for, for years to come. It's, it's, it is a part of our history. It's, it's written in stone, basically. Mr. Bedeker, our chairman now, he had come up to me one day and he said, you know, in the warehouse, we have all these black bags um, trash bags, if you will, there, you know, I, and I, and I don't want to belittle that by saying that it's, you know, it, it is, it's a trash bag, but it was used to protect. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I say a black bag, I'm referring to a trash bag, a plastic bag, so everyone can understand and visualize what I'm speaking to. And he said, we have hundreds of these, um, boxes that are wrapped up in trash bags in the back. And, um, and I and I they just have been there for years. And I and I was very curious as to what they were. And I had never opened them. And by that time I had been working here for um eleven years. And I had some volunteers and we had this large classroom and I said, open up all these boxes. I want to know what's in them. And in hundreds of boxes, there were memorial books that were signed. On September 12th, Mm. across the entire nation. Because when September 11th happened, 
it became a nation in grief. And it affected all of us worldwide. And so um, Mr. Waltrip seen the magnitude, the, the ripple effect that this had, and he had requested that every single one of his funeral homes around the nation, and to include Canada, to put a memorial book out for people to come and express their condolences to the, all of the lives that were lost that day. And we're talking about complete strangers. People mm-hmm. didn't know, but their death affected us all. And we, um, unbeknownst to me, were, was, we were holding history in our hands uh, in a way that, that I don't even think people realized that existed. And I said, wow, this is something that needs to be given honor and respect. And I ended up uh, curating an exhibit for the 15th anniversary of 9-11. And I had so many memorial books that I was able to build two Twin Towers out of them. How long did it take for you to get through all all of the material and and to decipher people's handwriting because that's another factor that you don't really take into consideration yeah. because you can go from ideation which is a genius idea to do it but then it's like oh wait a minute now I gotta hmm, Susie and Bob don't have good handwriting and I said Bob not realizing Bob Bedeker and <laughs> Bob okay. I'm not talking to you uh, <laughs> but yeah Susie and, and John <laughs> yeah um, right but yeah, yeah so um it wasn't so much about having to read the handwriting there were there were, it was interesting. Some of the books I would open up and literally there were uh, uh, handprint cutouts uh, oh. where you could see like an elementary school had, draw, had drawn photos of, of and making condolence cards. A whole classroom. I had a whole classroom of young kids in elementary school. Somehow they, they, they took all of those cards and, and took them to the funeral home. They ended up in these memorial books. And they, as I, as I was opening these books, the story was starting to be told to me in a, in a very different way. And I am, unfortunately, you know, when I'm curating exhibit, I really have to dive in and do a lot of research. And 15 years later, there was a lot of, uh, you know, information at my fingertips. I could get more uh, fine-tuned into the facts and the timelines mm-hmm. and, and really understand how that day unfolded. Yeah. And the events that took place right after, and in the, and I won't lie, there were some nights in my office where I was like, "Oh, this is too heavy. I've got to back off a little bit. I need a little bit of a break." That's saying a lot too, because you do more than operate the the museum. Yeah, I, I curate the exhibits. I do the research behind them, so I make sure that the the facts are being told. Yeah. Uh, when people come in and, and see them. And all the other stuff too. Your palliative nurse and your funeral director. So I mean, this is yeah. you know. Yeah. Death is my life, basically. You right. Know? And, and so, even then. But even then, it yeah. can get too much for me. And, yeah. and, and knowing my limits and, my, and, and where my boundary is, you know, so that I can back it off a little bit. And so as I was going and, and learning all this information at the same time, I'm trying to uh, envision how, how do I put this exhibit together and do it justice and honor and respect and tell the story as hard as this story is to tell. And I'm very proud of that exhibit. It, it was a temporary exhibit, but... It, it will come back in the 25th anniversary. So in three years, that exhibit will come back out again. I will rebuild that exhibit. But I, I have to say probably one of the most memorable uh, parts that I came across that ended up, I, which ended up leading me to another element of information that I needed to put into the exhibit was in, I believe it was October or November, I had a memorial book. And I came across it, and there was a memorial folder inside the book, and it was um, a a father and a son. And I looked at it, and I said, I immediately, I said, oh, my goodness. I said, I think we have a family's memorial book that accidentally got put in to this group of 9-11 memorial books. So a non-9-11 family's book. That's Oops. what I thought mm. when I when I opened it because mm. it had the memorial folder of a father and a son. Mm-hmm. And now, mind you, I'm I'm going through hundreds of books. Yeah, and so this one stood out 
from the rest. So they don't all look the same after you're in the flow of going through all these things. Well, they do because you, well, they you do. can kind of see mm. how, uh, you can understand how the memorial book that's set out and you can see the dates, right? September 11 or uh, September 12th, oh, okay, September yeah. 13th, September 4th. You can see that these are all books that were signed in September, mm-hmm. right? Because there was, a, I also came across the memorandum that said, uh, please have all your memorial books mailed to 1929 Allen Parkway. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe it was the end of October was when all these books were to be mailed. And, and they were, that was the collection point for all Mm -hmm. these books. And so when I came across this one in October, when most of the books were kind of completed in September, I had this one in October and I, and it had, like I said, this memorial folder of this, this father and son in it. And immediately I thought, Oh my gosh, a family's book is in this massive box of 9-11 memorial tributes. And so I said, I've I've got to return this book. This book has to get returned to the family. And so I started doing my research on their, the the family who, you know, type their names in and come to find out that they were a father and son sitting next to each other on one of the planes. And, and I was so moved by that. And, and it was during my research is where I learned exactly where they were sitting on the planes. So I actually was able to print out the manifest to see where they were actually sitting. And it became part of the exhibit showing, you know, putting it to me, it, it was so impactful that I thought this has to be shown that, you know, it, it, I don't know. I, I think at that moment, I kind of got to know two of the people there. Yeah. And, 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 and the, the story was being told. And it was, what happened was, is that the family had a memorial to them finally in October. So it was the actual memorial that the family held for them as victims that lost their lives on that day. And they became part of the exhibit as a, as two people that had faces. You talk about feeling as though you got to know two people personally who died. And as you recount that story, I'm thinking of how I see myself as a parent in the absolute worst case scenario. Yeah. With your kid. Yeah. Yeah. And And to perish with them. And to perish with them. I think about death. It's not my living, but I think about death quite often and I've accepted it. And I think you and I have have spoken about death before on a previous podcast interview. Um, And so I've heard you talk about it before. It's not death that we're scared of. It's the dying part. It's how we die. How we die. Yeah. Are we going to suffer? Is it it going to be quick? Are we going to know it's coming? It's, it's, It's all of that. And and there have been many of times that I, and I countless times, and, and I've done this since a child, yeah. is try to put myself into the place of that person that is meeting their demise in that moment. Yeah. It's like, did they know what, what went through their mind? Um, yeah. Was it fast enough that they had no, no ability to process the thought behind it? You know it's going to happen to your kids one way or another. You hope to God that it doesn't happen and they depart the earth before you, yet here we are, a son and his dad at the exact same moment. And so I wonder if that doesn't bring somebody some sort of level of comfort. Well, at least we won't suffer and we know we're meeting our demise and it's going to be quick. Yeah, it it, it kind of, just like you're curious as to what goes through their mind in that moment, but at yeah. the same time, um, you know, there's, you know, for me, it's, uh, you know, let me, let me do a, a, se- a, st- a sidestep, if you will. Sure. Um, you know, since it's kind of along these lines, when I was in the military, uh, they were giving out the vaccine for anthrax mm. and, um, and I, and I, and, and of course they were only giving the anthrax out to the service members because anthrax was a threat, uh, to, to our nation and you know, to our fighting forces and so I just remember I went to my coworkers and I said, "Well, aren't you going to vaccinate the families?" 
members. And they were like, no, only the service members. And I said, well, then I don't want it. Mm. I said, because if they're going to attack us with the anthrax, the worst thing I want to do is out survive my family. Mm-hmm. The, the, just the thought that my family would die from this you know, chemical warfare and I would survive, I, I don't want that. I don't want to out survive my children yeah. from that type of tragedy, mm-hmm. you know? And so thinking along the lines that if, you know, you know, if we had to part um, from our children, I would like to part with my children. Yeah. You I know? guess that's where I was going mm-hmm. because you already know that there, we all are going to, we're all going to die. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, if you were able to have that conversation with your maker yeah, exactly. and say, Hey, but then, you, <laughs> you know, know, you gotta, you gotta remember that this father and son died tragically together. Right. But you know that there's a mother that was left behind. And that's where it starts to that's get. That's where it starts to get very painful. Yes. You know, when you start, you know, there's that, that there's, there's a little sense of, of like, Oh, they went together, a comfort in knowing they went together. But then there's that pain right behind it that says, Mm -hmm. but what about the mother? Yes. and Because now the mother has to live with the fact that she's lost both of them. And what if this was a trip where they ended up on a plane and she at the last minute couldn't go and then she's got that survivor's guilt? Oh, yes. And survivor's guilt is very real. I'm sorry. Survivor's guilt is very real. And I think that there's a lot of times that people don't understand Mm -hmm. um, what it is and- and what it's supposed to feel like. But survivor's guilt doesn't go away. It, it, I think it stays with you for your lifetime. You're haunted by it. Yeah, it's a haunting, yes. You wake up every day and they're not there. And I mean, what, and we don't, I don't know. I, I clearly don't know the story of, these, of this family. Yeah, I don't know the, the story of the family beyond the fact of where they sat on the plane uh, <sighs> and that there was a memorial service held for them in October. Yeah. Um, that's, that's as far as I know. Um, but you know, we all, I think, you know, we we were talking earlier about how we get desensitized to death in whole, right. Um, through constant news feeds of death and, you know, just recently for some reason, there's been this feed coming up on my emails every morning. And the top story is somebody murdered somebody, somebody killed somebody. It's, it's death, 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 death every day. And, and I'm, I'm hypersensitive to that stuff. You know, if you watch the news, I can tell you the first five to seven minutes of that is all about death. Mm-hmm. That has occurred in our city or in our nation somewhere. But death happens every day. So undoubtedly, we're consistently exposed to it. But to what level are we exposed to it? And when I say what level is, are we just hearing it and allowing it to pass us by because we hear it all the time, we know it's there, but we don't want to address it. But then when it happens to us, it's so impactful. It's like a freight train out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. But if you would really sit down in a quiet moment and think about it, it can be very profound and very deeply seated because you're facing your own mortality. Yeah. And you had Haley Campbell on an earlier episode. I had the chance to talk to her late last year. And there was a statistic from her book, All the Living and the Dead, where she breaks down how many deaths happen around the world within the course of 24 hours and within one hour of just us being here. And you think about somebody taking their final breath one or two people or however many it is, I forget the stat, but before the, from minute one to minute 45 or however long this episode goes, there'll be people that die. Yeah. Right now, as we talk, you know, there's somebody dying. Last hour. Yeah. Last hour. There are funerals all over the world happening. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but on the contrary, just as there's death happening every minute, there's also birth Yeah, happening. It's the cycle of life. If you think of it, you know, there's babies being hundreds of babies being born every hour, you know, all around the world. And, and at the same time, there's just as many deaths happening. Something that makes me think during 
is how certain people can seem to be desensitized to it, how some people can be oversensitive to it, and then how some people are, you know, it's, they're one way or the other, but it's for like five minutes and then everything is back to, back to normal. Yeah, right. Exactly. Huh? Yeah. So, yeah. I, and, and I think that is an innate feature within the human, ex- the human being itself. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because you have to think about it. We cannot grief and the, the, uh, the impact a stressful situation has upon the body. If you can think about it at a cellular level. Mm-hmm. Okay. It causes chemicals and hormones to be triggered and released in the body. Like cortisol, the stress yeah. hormone, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, um, and, and your adrenaline, like your fight or flight response and stuff mm-hmm. like that. You know, there's different chemicals that get released in the body that, that are there for our survival, really, truly. And they're there to help us cope with tragic situations or life-threatening situations. But our bodies are not programmed to be able to sustain that level of chemical compound within our blood bloodstream, right? Yeah. And, and, and our heart and, and organs having to deal with that. So it's actually unhealthy for us to maintain that level. So you talk about, we think about it, and then in five minutes later, we're on to something else. It's almost a coping mechanism and a survival skill at the same time, if you think about it. Because if we didn't, then we would all probably be at the bottom of a bottle somewhere. None of us would probably get out of bed and the world would cease to exist. You know, interesting, you know, we're, we're sitting here and we're talking about how impactful grief is. And we actually have an item in the museum that speaks to that. It's a triple casket. Oh, yes. And this triple casket, you know, we go back and we're talking about being the loss of a child, mm-hmm. right? And the power of the grief that's experienced when a child departs this earth before you. So our triple casket uh, was built by a husband and wife who lost their child to death. And their grief was so heavy that they felt they, they, couldn't, they couldn't continue on. They didn't care. They didn't want to live. So kind of back to what I was saying earlier, I don't want to outlive my children. Most of us don't. Most of us don't. We don't want to outlive our children. And here this family was faced with that fact of outliving their child. And the grief was so heavy, they wanted to join her in death. And so they had a murder-suicide pact. They went to their local funeral director, asked them to have this special casket made and so that all three of them can be buried together. They were going to have the, the child exhumed. Um, after the ca- casket was created, the murder-suicide was to happen. The, the child was to be exhumed. They were all to be buried together and be in eternal rest forever together. And the manufacturing process of the materials getting shipped in because it was a custom piece, it took time. Back then, you know, uh, grief wasn't so talked about as it is today. And they didn't realize that with time, grief does begin to lift. It lessens. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it gets you to a point where you're like, okay, all right. The, 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 the cloud is starting to pass. The sun is starting to shine. I can start to, to live life again. And that's exactly what happened to them. The, the grief began to lessen, the sun began to shine, and they realized that they did not want to join their child in death. And so, thankfully, the, the murder-suicide never happened. Child is still resting in its final, uh, you know, initial resting place. And the casket uh, sat forever in this factory um, until the factory closed, and then it was um, gifted to the museum with the tragic story that thankfully never happened. Beautifully painful, painfully beautiful. Yes. Um, and and here we're talking about the father and son that died tragically on nine eleven, and and bringing it back to to mourning not just loved ones, but mourning as a nation. Yeah, and the effect that death truly does have on us all. You know, on 9-11, it was more of a, a of attack on us all, right? I mean, yes, it was it was a, a large amount of the lives lost. It was heroes lost. Um, it was an unnecessary evil that attacked us all and our livelihood. Um, 
And I think that that is what resonates and made that ripple effect. And still today we feel that grief. And speaking of, of mourning as a nation and as Houstonians, because we are in the Houston area and the National Museum of Funeral History. And while the 15th anniversary special uh, exhibit is, is gone and you're bringing back another one for the 25th anniversary, you do have an exhibit featuring some urns. Yes, we have uh, urns that house the ashes of Ground Zero. We were entrusted and um, given the custodian of these urns from the Port Authority of New York. And the the ashes of Ground Zero, um, although you don't, they're not, how would I say it? They're not like one person in that urn. It's, 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 it's ground debris. It's, it's the stuff, it's the ashes from that space. So there's so much there. It's, it's the, the entire, uh, uh, calamity of, of it all, if you will. So it could be remnants of a car, remnants of a building, remnants of a beam, Mm. human remains, animal remains, or, or whatever was from that area. And and I feel weird asking. No, it it would be more or less just the, um, it's the, I wouldn't, you know, no metal because, you know, metal doesn't, doesn't really reduce itself to ash. It's more of, of all of the, um, the stuff that, that can burn and become ash, you know, Mm -hmm. the, you know, um, the, everything, the, the office supplies, the people, the, um, the, whatever was in that building, it's, it's everything. Um, but we know, um, in our heart of hearts, we know that it's the people that matter the most that's in that urn. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the things that uh, are irreplaceable. And a recurring theme of, I guess, just when it comes to people who work in the death care industry, and I've spent enough time with you um, to kind of understand where all of this where all of you are coming from when it, you know, when it's, it's okay to mourn, it's okay to be sad. You have to do this. this is all part of the process. Uh, my, my wife works within the death care industry as well. So I very much know all of that from her, her perspective as well. And so it's one of those things where if maybe, maybe you're having trouble explaining something to a younger person and this would be a great time to come out to the museum and explain like, this is why this is why this kind of stuff is important and why it's embedded into the cultural fabric of, of our nation and why we make sure that we don't forget what's happening. And yes, you're right. We won't, we don't know every single individual. We never will. Exactly. But at the same time, it's important to show respect for what happened to these people? And I think it's important also to show how we should never be forgotten. You know, why, why it's important um, to have the opportunity to mourn the loss of a human being, uh, to reflect on the life that was lived by that human being, uh, to understand the lives that person left behind and the impact that it had upon them. Um, but importantly, you know, they always say, oh, know your history. So we don't repeat it again. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, it's know your history. So you never forget those that were important to us. It's also thinking about how young somebody may have been when they, when they passed away that day and living up to your potential, knowing that, well, you know, this person was 26 in 2001 and so was I. And they did not get to live to where I'm soon to be 48 at the time of this recording. And so thinking about that and reflecting on it, and this is something that I sort of taught myself um, when we go and visit my my in-laws at the cemetery, 
unfortunately, both my mother and my father, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law are, are deceased. And, and when we go visit them and a few spots down, there's a, there's somebody, Jonathan Kyle Lunsford, who was born in the summer of the same year I was born. And I forget the birthday. But Sorry. you remember his name and that's important. One day he was here and then he was gone. And, and it's, so it's an exercise in, in living up to your, to your fullest potential that there are people who, I mean, this guy didn't get to experience anything that I ever have gotten to experience. And so bringing it back to 20 to 2001, you know, the people who are my age. Yeah. That, that, uh, yeah. Like, we're able to reach that age, you know, yeah. I, and I, and I reflect on that too, uh, on the death of my sisters. One of my sisters passed away at 39 and I kid you not, when I turned 40, that was the hardest, hardest birthday. And I can still remember the impact that it had on me mm-hmm. because I thought how unfair she never got to be 40. Yeah. You know, we, you know, we, we talk about birthdays as, oh, it's another year, but really a birthday is, wow, I got to have another year. What a know? gift. What a gift. Yeah. Cause so many people don't get that, you know, yeah. and, and there are so many people that don't get that choice to get that, you know, I mean, yeah, we all have choices in life and there are unfortunately, uh, you know, some people who take their lives. And I do want to speak to that. There are people that commit suicide because they feel that life, they can't go on anymore. And we talked about that with the triple casket. That was a choice that they were going to make. And, uh, you know, we're talking about grief and the impact that grief has on us. And, uh, and we're, and, and we have, you know, this constant, um, almost like this bipolar conversation where we're talking about life. And in the next moment we're talking about death. And so it, it, it's, um, it's an up and it's a down. And I, I do want to say that, you know, sometimes suicide is because the grief is just too heavy. People just can't see out of it. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and again, um, if you do know somebody that, you know, is suicidal and has experienced, um, some tragedy in their life, you know, do reach out to them. And a lot of times and all the time, actually, and that's the best thing that somebody can do is just reach out and make the effort. And I mean, I would like to think that even if, they don't take your call or answer your text back. They see that you called. They see that that they mattered enough to for somebody to reach out to them. And maybe they didn't have the energy or the bandwidth to take your call or answer your text. They leave you on red. That if you keep at it, yeah, it, keep at it, they'll answer. Yeah, and you know, I've seen you know death to me. Uh, I've seen all the faces of death. You know, I've seen. Uh, you know, with 9-11, it's the tragic face of death, right? People, uh, you know, didn't have a choice. Someone chose to take their lives. Uh, and then I've seen where disease took somebody's life. You know, my husband and I were talking about that last in our last month's podcast of how uh, we have a very healthy friend who whose life was snatched away by cancer. In 9-11, everyone's life was snatched away by the terrorists. And then, you know, there are people who take their own lives and, and and snatch their own life away, but it's because of the dark demons that lie within, um, and we don't know the names of those demons. You know, it could be a, a demon named grief, but unless we walk in their shoes, we do not understand. So, I think it's important that we understand that death comes in so many forms and fashions. But I think the most popular one that we're exposed to are the tragic ones, you know, people who die at the hands of another person. And that seems to be what is most talked about. It's what's in entertain. It's in our entertainment uh, venues. It's in the news. But there's more faces yeah. to death than, than what we're mostly exposed to. Yeah. And bringing it back to to the conversation with Haley is that you only see that kind. You don't see everyday, normal, boring death. Yeah, exactly. Like the death of, uh, you know, that people just die naturally. You know, I, I'm working on a Queen Elizabeth exhibit and I actually have a copy of her death certificate from, uh, from the Scotland Yard. And when I looked at the cause of death, 
I just had this like, wow, finally, I, I haven't seen that face of death in forever, you know? Uh, and, and her face of death was old age. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what we all can hope for, right? That we die yeah. of old age in our sleep, surrounded by our family, right? Or old age in our sleep peacefully, right. you know? And, and, and to see that on her death certificate was, I don't, it was just so peaceful. It was so odd <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, there, so many causes of death are, are, are disease or, you know, a cardiac arrest secondary to respiratory failure or, you know, it's just all this other stuff, but I don't think I've ever, ever got to see a death state with this at old age. Old age. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Maybe the last one would be Betty White. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, just last, last month uh, in pop culture and he's from Houston, Patrick Swayze and look at how he died. Tragically. Yeah, tragic, pancreatic yeah. cancer. I mean, what, I mean, you talk about the worst of the worst. I mean, cancer is a demon in and of itself. Oh, it is. Having yeah. the deadliest form of cancer. Uh-huh. I mean, we all will die. You know, it's, 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 it's certain, right? And it's just, we don't know how we're going to die. We don't know our method of death. We don't know what will take us to that final moment. It's the unknown. It's the unknown. And that's what's scary. Yeah. You know, and like I say, I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid of how I'm going to die. And there are so many different exposures of death that I've, you know, I, like I said, I have been or seen um, that I, I try to envision, you know, what that person went through. And I would be like, Oh gosh, I, that's not, I don't want that one. It's almost like I, I, I'm, I'm filtering out the modes of death. Right. And I'd be like, I don't want that one. I don't want that. Okay. I can handle that one. No, I don't want that one. You know, (laughs) you can go shopping at the grim reapers death store. What would you pick out? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, You know, I mean, definitely not drowning. Oh, definitely not drowning. You know, for me, I just, I can't, um, I, I can't even hold my breath very long when I'm taking a shower because I, you know, I have to breathe. I, I, I can't hold my breath very long underwater. So definitely not drowning <laughs> yeah. for me. Um, and, and, and it just, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. I, I guess when death is your profession and death is your life and you have been exposed to death in, in the manners that I have, right. It's, I'm not morbid. I'm just exposed. Yeah. You know, and because I'm, I have that level of exposure, like most people don't, um, it puts me into a different thought process on Mm. things, you know, I mean, I, it's just, I look at death very different. I don't wish to put my thumb on the scale of how people live their lives. I would say that life would be a lot easier if more people Kind of have that outlook because I think yeah. it would, people would find it not so bad. Yeah. And if people would, I, I always like to use embrace, right? Yeah. When you think of embracing, you think of that as a, as, as a comforting term, uh, arms wrapped around you, someone comforting you. Um, so it's like, how do you embrace death when death is not a comforting topic or subject matter? Um, but if you can embrace it in a way that you, understand that we will all experience it. I like to think that people could have a more open concept to the effect that it has on everybody and it affects everybody differently. Yeah. And if we can respect that, like different religions, if we could respect that as well, I think we could have a more harmonial way of living our life. Exactly. And that's part of the mission right here at the National Museum of Funeral History in North Houston. So we hope to see you here, whether it's the 9-11 exhibit, whether it's the Shroud of Turin, the most famous burial of all time. Or it's learning about the history of our presidents and the funerals that we had for them because when a president dies, it affects the nation as well. Um, Or if you just want to walk down memory lane and thanks for the memories and, and reflect again on the lives that people had that uh, entertained us, and they too are gone. I remember I was doing the Thanks for the Memory exhibit, and uh, we were focusing on the Wizard of Oz segment, and 
I remember I was watching a video on Dorothy and I have holding the memorial folder of the lady who played Dorothy. And I sat back in my chair and in that moment I said, oh my gosh, Dorothy is dead. And I said, I never thought that Dorothy could die because Dorothy is never dead to me because she's forever alive in the movie, The Wizard of Oz. And she looks the same. And she looks the same. Every time. (laughs) Every time. It was an epiphany. It was, it literally had a freight train effect on me. I I, I was, I, I can't believe it. She's dead. Dorothy's dead. I'm like, but movies keep them alive. That's probably also why we have such a hard time with with historical figures, whether they're political leaders or uh, movie stars, musicians, because they remind of us. They remind us of a certain time in our lives that were the good old days, whether or not they were actually good, but they were the good old days back when back when we were young, or back in our twenties, or back in our thirties, or if you're eighty, back in our sixties. When oh yeah, I mean, because yeah. like you know, you you can always remember back. I mean, thankfully, yeah, we are we're talking. You know, we, we we started out our segment talking about a, a a time in life where it was very tragic, but now we're talking about remembering remembering some happy times. Like you said, we're we're watching. I remember watching The Wizard of Oz, and every time I watch The Wizard of Oz, I'm taken back to that moment. Yeah, you know, and interesting enough. You know, talking about that, my granddaughter, who is four, and she is hooked on Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the original one right now. Mm. You know, I think she's an old soul trapped in a young body. And she's watched Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, oh gosh, I think like maybe a dozen times already in the last month. Um, and because and, my daughter tells me about it all the time. So yesterday she was here. And I could, she walked into Thanks for the Memories, and she said, Oh, Willie Hat. <laughs> Out of everything in the museum, she recognized Willie Wonka's hat that we have. And when, and think about it, when she's 20 years old mm-hmm. and she sees Willie Wonka in the chocolate factory at 20, he's still going to be alive to her. Yeah. And she's going to remember that moment of perhaps coming to the National Museum of Funeral History and seeing Willy Wonka's hat. So we, we sit here and we, we, you know, we talk about these memories and how powerful they are to us. And, and some of them are positive memories, and unfortunately some of them are negative memories. But it's all in how we allow them to be in our life and part of our life and how we walk through life with these memories. And that's a wonderful way to wind it down. But before we do, there are some things happening this fall. Yes, the, the museum is always a buzz at, this, at, at the fall time. October is our most popular month. And so we've got some awesome events lined up in October. On October the 13th, Friday the 13th, we're putting together a, the Witch's Brew Market. Uh, kind of think of the Nutcracker Market, but for, for the Halloween time frame. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And so that's going to be October 13th. And you can get tickets online on our website at www dot nmfh.org. Uh, we have, you get a lot for your money, um, but we also, so we, the general admission ticket is $40 and you can upgrade to a VIP for $35 more, making it a $75 ticket, but you get an hour uh, early entrance. You will also get an extra drink ticket and you will be getting a commemorative uh, handmade wine cup from that states the witch's brew uh, from Nays Cups and Creations, and you'll be getting a pair of witchy earrings from Crazy Creations as part of your VIP package. And uh, so we hope to see you all here. We've got a lot of amazing vendors lined up to include some of those oddity vendors that you would expect to see at the National Museum of Funeral History. And then, of course, if you love cars, you definitely, definitely have to come out to our annual Halloween car show on October 28th. Our parking lot will be full of fascinating cars dressed up for Halloween, and we'll have a trunk or treat for children. Uh, there is an admission also for the car show. You can, you can go online and get all that information. We will also be putting on our family-friendly haunted house for the month of October. And uh, again, the, all of that information will be online. 
And uh, we hope to see you all here in the month of October. We're really excited. And my staff is working really hard to put all these fun family events together for our community here in Houston at the National Museum of Funeral History. Genevieve, thank you so much for letting me join you this episode. Yeah, it was a hard episode, but I, I, I couldn't do this one solo. I think it was more, it needed to be a conversation. Thank you. Hey, it's me. One quick favor before you hit stop on that podcast player. If you got value from this episode, please consider sharing with your family and friends, leaving a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform, and signing up for the newsletter at cruisethroughhtx.com.